Between the time when chaos broke Cadia and the return of the sons of the Emperor, there was an age undreamed of. And unto this, Cronan, wearer of the jeweled crown of Aquilonia, upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. And so it was that our hero, Cronan, loudly lauded as the cunning one, which was no mere titular epithet, I can assure you. In fact, of all the Eulars that one might think of, Cronan was the least titish one could imagine. Was he not the leader of the cunning war? And not just that, but the very anointed emissary of the great guard, Mork. Anointed in blood and viscera for certain, but anointed nonetheless. Was he not the most orky of all orcs, apart from perhaps Gansgul Mag Uruk Thraka? Of course he was. Now let's not throw a cushion down and assume the position and fluff him up too much, is what some might say. But I say thee nay, nay I say thee. For you are not listening to me, the most unworthy, lowly chronicler of his most prodigious, explicitly violent and fighty legend, to hear these very utterances, to bask in the glory of the most cunning and fighting orc in all of Aquilonia, which most now called Orquilonia, if truth be told, but it had not been redesignated by the Humes or even the foppish Eldar, and so Cronan could not in good conscience admit victory in this matter. He did look, for it was his wont to do, on his beloved data slate. Whenever he opened it, he did just scan past to see if it had been updated somehow. You know, the name of the planet. Yet, not having any understanding on this subject whatsoever, Cronan was on a high road to nowhere. He had not actually visited a new Humi system, had not plugged in the data slate, nor could he have gotten onto any form of intergalactic net to do so. Whether one existed or not, well, that was a tad more tricky. So we have to fade down on that subject, as I dazzle you with another topic entry. And so it was, that Cronan had won yet another victory, to add to his role of honours, and Cronan was indeed the cunning one. So, as he now understood more of the nature of the orcs than near any who had ever lived, well, is what he told himself when he bothered to self-scrutinize, which, again being frank or earnest, was an incredibly rare occurrence. Yet, he was confident he was near a mystic brain boy level of awareness of the habits of his own people, the Greenskins, the beloved of Mork and Gork the greatest warrior race to ever exist, the Orcs. And when he did introspect recently, for about a half a minute or so, he came to yet another staggering realisation. It mattered what his people thought of him. It mattered a lot. Now, Cronin had always been intensely Orky, as we know, so he was as forthright as any good Orc should be yet magnified, of course, as he was magnified by his lord, his guard, Mork. Hence, he had been what the jealous would dub a horrific, shameless show-off. Yet Cronan had seen the effect this had made on his past, his very existence. For as surely as a grot bites the head off a snot that annoys him, Cronan's sheer popularity had saved his bacon more than once, whatever that is. Hence, Cronan now took his seed of wisdom, of understanding, and created from it a mighty tree. Well, he definitely made something of it. A tree is very ecologically sound, but perhaps not what Cronan was thinking of at that time. Nor at any other time, really. For orcs were not known for their green warrior credentials, despite indeed being the very epitome of warriors of green complexion. Either way, Cronan took action and he set up what he called the Mystery of Truth. It had a rather broad remit, is what one might think if you heard of such a thing being used in a Humi population, for they were to support and spread the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Now Humes might see this sort of organization empire build, until it had a seat on the High Lords of Terror, or some other august body, solely creeping in to warp how everyone perceived the situation, mostly concerning the actions and reactions of the governing body who instituted the Bureau, usually. Funny, that. Luckily, the only truth that mattered to both Cronan and, by extension, all of his people, was that their lord, Cronan, was the biggest, most cunning and fightiest of all the orcs. His mystery of truth was given control of the Pictum Vid feeds and told to monitor them, but also to make certain that the proper truth of the good life was given unto the ever-expanding war. Thus, the mystery of truth went about making the screening of some of Cronan's greatest hits the central point of the social calendar. The Squig Games, the duel with Tooth Smasher, the hunt for Red October, and now the defeat of the Chaos Humi fleet, interspersed with advertisements for the next league games of golf, and which barely needed any advertising at all, was the most favoured viewing of all, the Squig Surprise events. And so it was that the mystery of truth merely reminded all of the beefiness of their boss of bosses, and how much fun they had all received as a bounty from his genius. The latest rounds of the interwar fleet origlotmy competitions were also intensely popular. The inclusion of a crack grenade into random grots before the matches was a stroke of mawkish genius on Cronan's part yet again. Few indeed ever said anything even partially less than absolutely glowing about the big boss Cronan. For those who did, it seemed that they were almost immediately subjected to a catastrophic loss of blood as their body parts just fell off one another. And this is exactly what Cronan's mystery and the towering Black Legion knobs who escorted them would always state when they had discovered yet another of these strangely disloyal orcs. Now this deeply spiritual moment was often preceded by a lot of crashing around and screaming, but this was all part of the event, and it was often the screaming of newfound devotion that was thought to have caused the orc's limbs and head to fall off. Before long, all waved and smiled at the mystery members as they wandered about performing their good deeds, and those who were asked questions by the mystery members often felt the warmth of truth as they sweated out all fear and evil when just in the presence of such a helpful and jolly embassage from the boss. With that in place, all was running along smoothly. Daka von Smashhoven was running drills and trying to increase the air wings. He had plenty of flyers now, as Isap had been working with him quite a lot recently. And with all the muggins and gubbins they had found all over the fleet, well, mostly on recently acquired Humi stair sheeps, the number of flyers was multiplying fast. Yet, even amongst those who claimed to be speed freaks, the knack of void and atmospheric dogfighting was not for all. As Dacker himself could not really get behind fleet actions on the larger scale, much to Cronin's disappointment, so it was also true that many a speed freak was actually only really interested in, or able to perform within, a land-based vehicle. Yet, despite the losses, Dacker von Smashhoven was indeed gaining new recruits, and his drills were a thing to add to the entertainments of the fleet. For Dacker did not believe in molly coddling those in the fighter wings. So, although there was much scrap to be collected after each live fire engagement, those who remained were nicely stiffened up. And Dacker was a popular boss, despite it all. His men knew that he wanted the best out of them. Now, the situation with Tiddles had been mostly resolved, well, on the short term, for Cronan had kept him close since the disappearance of Bashtor. Knowing what a spiteful little turd it might well be, Cronan was not in the least concerned for his own well-being, huh, of course not, but he did consider that Bashtor or any of Toba's new flunkies may well strike at his beloved pet, and that would have led to a Rowengi killing spree so terrible that it would make Mr. Wick demure in shock and state things like, oh crumbs, that was stabby, while losing his lunch due to the ultraviolence on display. But mostly, it was due to Cronan being on one of only two ships for the last few days. He was either on his flagship, the Mork Rampant, 
or on the huge space hulk they had wrestled from the clutches of the chaos-worshipping R-starters, the word blarers. For there was much fun to be had on the vessel. It was absolutely gargantuan. In orky terms, if Cronan's massive stair sheep was a fly, then the space hulk was the size of a giant squigoth dump. Yeah, that big. And it was swiftly discerned that the Chaos Marines had not been nearly as thorough as one might have thought from Humi elite warriors, for they had left Cronan a great gift, something to really get his teeth into, and his fists, his chopper, his shooter, his boot even, one might suppose, but a gift it was indeed. For the Chaos R starters had taken control of the Hulk, is what they had initially thought, but no. It turned out that these lackadaisical scum had merely cleared the outer shell near the hull. They had then locked or soldered strategic entry points and airlocks across the sheep so that those things in the interior of the sheep could not get out. Yet Cronan and his greenskins were agog when they found out the level of incompetence and general killjoyery that had been performed by said chaos-worshipping wimps. For they had seen the blast on solder marks and began to open them up. And the true gift was almost immediately discerned by the wah. For inside the hulk were scores of miles, maybe more, of differing ship interiors, gangways, corridors and rooms. Yet all were not empty. No. For inside were a teeming hive of huge buggins. Excellent, thought Cronan. The initial forays inside proved that they were neither small in number nor short of fun. The survivors of the initial scouting teams came back with beaming eyes and a spring in their step. Well, those who did not have to drag themselves back, missing large proportions of their body and leaving huge green blood trails behind them anyways. There were a dizzying array of them of near every size. As you got further into the interior, the bigger and nashier they became music to Cronan's ears, and of course, to the entire war. Many had already preemptively bemoaned the potential lack of forward momentum in the war, should the mechs take too long on this new huge hulk. You know, making it usable as a conveyance, taking control of its key systems and the like. But to know that any delay would have the monotony broken with a potential humdinger of a brawl? Well, that assuaged many a troubled brow. Not that Cronan or any Greenskin would have put it that way, for there was now great pressure on Cronan to choose those lucky scamps who would get to go in first with the Lord of the War. For again, as with the recent fleet action, all believed Cronan would be in the very thick of the event, and few believed he would leave any behind for others. Well, it may have been believed, but who would outright state such beliefs and risk their head and arms and legs falling off? Nobody. That's who. Well, maybe the grot, but literally nobody listened to those snivelling turds. Alas, there is no update on the grots this time around, for their numbers were prodigious and their uses expanding to match this surfeit. But other than that, I have nothing to report this time, so let us push on to the main event. And when I call it that, I was certainly not understating the situation. It was a truly fantastic time had by all. For, as we shall see, even the bugs seemed to have a whale of a time. Well, to be more precise, there was certainly a lot of whaling to be sure. And who but the Humis or Eldar would not veritably jump with joy at the thought of such a colossal scrap in the offing? Again, nobody, that's who. Now the buggins seemed to know their role in the matter, and appeared to be eagerly awaiting the coming of the cunning one, as none of the buggins had so much as attempted a single solitary sortie outside of the realms of their hive construct in the depths of the space hulk. All could feel their compliance in the fray to come, for they were not wasting their efforts on sallying out. Oh no, they were preparing themselves for the fun to come, and all tensions rose to fever pitch as Cronan went back on show to the entire fleet the entire congregation of his people, and took out the cold storage kegs again. And he did another draw. Randomly pulling out a keg, 
and taking out the head of a grot with an icon of allegiance on it. Thus were the first mobs prepared for the job, and plenty of spares were picked. Now, after the first score of mobs were allocated, all believed that those following up would be little more than a grandized clean-up team, for they all knew that none of the buggins would be able to stand before the power of their lord. But midway through the draw, all were aghast and then elated, for Cronan declared he would not be leading the first wave in. This re-energized the entire ritual, sending the war into a frenzy of attention and celebration, with the name of their boss or horde, mob or sheep, were picked out. If Cronan was not in the thick of it, well, in that case, there might well be enough buggins to make this a real event. Cronan also swore by the perfect biceps, triceps, and all the seps of Mork that he would permit any to claim booty as they ranged the regions temporarily held by the buggins. Sidebar. Concerning booty. One might think that the orcs would have rather a rigid hierarchy, also that they might be so dense as to not understand the concept of booty. But if there is one thing you can take to the bank, it's that orcs crave booty as much as a dark elder disregards safe words. In fact, it was not merely the rampaging carnage and unspeakable violence that was involved in raiding or freebooting that was the only draw. Although the urges of the orcs were reliable, in that they usually ran to slaughter, there were some other urges as well, not just amongst the weird and other odd boys either. There was a need for food, of course, but also the need for speed, a well-documented primal urge in many a greenskin, but there was also the urge for intimidatingly shiny bling, righteous drip, or, put simply, stuff that made them look odd. Being odd was one thing, and by far the better, of course. But, as Cronin had gathered as well, perception had meaning. And looking odd was also a definite positive. It would mean less challenges to a knob or boss. Now this could be construed as a bad thing. For a lack of fighting was as dangerous to an orc as an all-you-can-smoke weed shop is to a hippie. But there must be consideration to not just the quantity, but also the quality of the engagement. For to a true orky orc, it is better to wrestle an Imperial Titan naked and covered in Prometheum Accelerant than it is to just slog through wimps. No, oh, there will be a certain pride from a job well done and done well, but when not clearing a region, then stacking up hundreds of feeble civilian Humies was more a necessary task than a vocation. And Humies did make good slaves, it was true. Yet the point stands. If the fight was not worthy of the orc, well, it could leave this unscratched itch that would irritate the green skin until the next decent scrap. Now do bear in mind that orcs do like to win. Of course they do. But by Gork's manly and incredibly sharp back molars, a proper fight had to be at least a bit of a challenge. Thus, reading was all well and nice, but the real hope was that the planet, village, city or sheep that was being raided had at least a bit of fight left in it before the battle. Perhaps even a decent hero or two, to really test out the skills and speed, strength and brutality of the orcs participating. And it was well known by all, be it Eldar, Humi, or the Toe Empire liar cast, the harder they were, the more bling they had. Hats, power choppers, sweet rare ducker, or even grenades. The best wielded the best, so to have a trove of accolades that all could see, it would ward off the time wasters and leave only the truly fighty to challenge the orc in possession of such accoutrements of power. Hence, as a sign of status, to permit a green skin to become a knob or boss, the acquisition of gubbins and muggins was a must. So, to sum up, to conclude, orcs love booty. They crave it. They want to sink their teeth into booty and slap it and watch it shudder. To an orc, booty was all. End sidebar. And so it was that the first ways were chosen and prepared. Now one might scratch one's head concerning the decisions for Cronan to not lead the charge himself. But this was in keeping with his new modus operandi. 
what most would consider an alteration in his managerial style. He had decided that he would now get to know his warlords better. As orcs, he knew them pretty well, for many of his closest adherents had been with him from the early days, and of course, as we have identified already, Cronan did often give jobs to his chums. Yet, he knew them on a tribal or planetary army scale, but he had not really seen them in action up close and personal. Now, without a doubt, this had more to do with the fact that Cronan did so enjoy what he did. Hence, in all of the scraps and even larger bundles that he had participated in, well, he had taken stock of the battlefield, as we have often heard, but in reality, he was as orky as any orc could wish to be. Hence, he had utterly immersed himself in the glorious butchery. Which meant he intensely enjoyed the company of his direct concilium, his coterie of complete, um, cads. But he needed to know how they would perform when he was not directly driving events. Now most would realize the sacrifice that Cronan was giving unto his entire people, that he, the cunning one, would not be the first through the breach, the first into every last room, nosing around and crumping everything he found. But he would forego this immediate bliss, the return to his natural state, to be in the midst of a truly gratuitous furball. Yet, for his people, but also for his own legend, Cronan knew he had to look more at the long game. And it did provide him the most exquisite of entertainment, which was a cold comfort most of the time, but today it was about right for the cunning one. For the last thing he needed was to look at his bosses through rose-tinted glasses, or something like that. But the point is that Cronan had set up the mystery of truth himself, so he, of all people, could hardly shy away from it, most especially not in his hand-picked aids. And so it was that Cronan chose the bosses that were taking the fun to the buggins. Gitzgusha McMurder was practically bouncing up and down so fast that he was in danger of shifting into another dimension when he was informed he would have the overall command of a third of the forces. And it was definitely time to see what tragic violence, the only relatively new face amongst the three, could do. For tragic violence had risen to the top in Cronan's um, Black Legion, his honor guard. And tragic had to be tested. Not in his combat abilities, of course, for they had been well attested. He had not become the cat pain generous of the Black Legion for no reason, for he was intensely generous in the crumpings he dealt out, both as a member of the Legion, but then also as the most enthusiastic of the Legion in helping out the mystery of truth. He had a huge stack of converted doggins in his possession now, and he was now grating up against McMurder in many meetings. So, it was time to put up or shut up. Tragic would be leading in a third of the forces, but they would not include the Legion themselves. Cronan wanted to see how he did on hard mode by giving him only boys to boss about. Taking the Legion in would be up to Cronan, and only if he deemed it necessary. Tragic was practically beaming at Cronan when the order was given. He soon sniffed and grinned at McMurder's developing scowl. It was only the last big boss that seemed less than elated at the prospect of leading boys into a tightly confined set of eminently trap-festooned corridors filled with irate and very bitey buggins. Most marvelled at his doleful nod of acceptance of this singular honour. Grinata Backstabber seemed to be a very odd duck, whatever that was, for he mooched out of the boss bash with shoulders as sloped and sagging as those who had not been offered a crack at the first rounds. Unfathomable. Yet, in his ultimate wisdom, Cronan had expected this reaction. This test was about more than just fighting and winning, or getting torn to pieces and consumed, then shat out by the buggins in the form of their little gnashy ones. Oh, no. As Cronan had tested his fleet admirals, Hakbar and Grand Mouth Tartan, so must he also test his generals of the impending land battles. He needed to know exactly what they would do when they didn't think he was watching, and like an equal opportunities questionnaire, no answer was a wrong one. He just needed to know. 
Oh, he fully expected at least one of them to end up being fang fodder. And sort of counted on it, really. For although Cronin did not wish to be in the first waves, due to his little staff training exercise, but he was hoping very stridently that there would be a requirement for him to lead in the Black Legion to end the matter. For Cronin did so wish to battle against the Buggins. Yet, Cronin was also not as concerned as others might have been, for Cronin had sook and received enlightenment. He knew the enemy better than any who had previously fought them, or so he thought. For he had not just consulted his data slate, the findings of which we shall get into in a moment. He had also gathered all of the bosses that had ever fought the Buggins before. Now, one might think that this would be next to nobody, for was this not a local affair, this cunning war? But no. Anyone who would state such a thing did not understand the blessed movements of the Greenskins, nor the amazing power of the Call of the War. For orcs have many ways to move through the galaxy, the obvious, which would be the freebooter fleets, but also space hawks and rocks also. Now, when a freebooter fleet coalesced, it did not often stay in the same patch. If it were attached to an orc empire, then things would be different, but many a freebooter raiding fleet would just head in our direction until destroyed or called by an amassing war. Hence, many of the flotillas that joined the fleets of Cronan were not from around these parts at all, and the strange conglomeration of so many orcs brought with it a wealth of information for those with the wit to ask the right questions. Now, the gathered bosses did indeed provide Cronan with the information he required to back up that which he had noted from his communing with his blessed data slate. But then, it devolved into that topic most often to arise at such discussions. Sidebar. The tastes of the high fleets. Now the Buggins, which most of the other races called the Terracids, or something like that, probably because they were afraid of them, one would imagine. Well, they were known to consume all in their path, harvesting every last nutrient from the planet they infested, yet none truly considered the other side of the equation. Yes, the Buggins are very effective at eating every last morsel on a globe. This could not be denied. But just because they snaffled a lot in one gigantic gob, it did not mean that other peoples were not equally voracious, just in a more measured and sustainable way. This was definitely true of the mighty sons of Gork and Mork, the Orcs. For where others might demure at culinary exploration, this was certainly not true of the Greenskins. For if it didn't shoot back, didn't brandish a meaty-looking chopper of its own, then no matter what that thing was, it was fair game for noshing on. And the other races again might be concerned about consuming oodles of terracids in case it made their tummies rumbly and their bodies squitty. Yet the greenskins were not particularly prone to this condition. So when a massive mushti against the buggins had been concluded, then it was indeed snacking time. And the buggins provided a lot of incredibly tender cuts when prepared expertly. Of course, there would always be some buggins that retain their acid and poison sacks, which would, of course again, lead to absolute hilarity when they were discovered in the usual way, being the acid eating through the orc as it ate through the buggin. Yet, when one discovered the right way to avoid such dangers, they could even be considered delicacies. Hence the orcs would often have huge banquets when they defeated the last of them on the field of glory, or gory, or was that the field of glory that was gory, or the gory field that was glorious? Huh. Sounds like an issue for another day, but it happened, both regularly and frequently. So the orcs were well versed at how these beings tasted. Now High Fleet, leave it at home buggins, were deemed far more like Humi than was comfortable. Beehy Mouth had a delicious taste not dissimilar to Lobster Squig. Whereas High Fleet cracked in, were reported to taste more of Grox than anything else. But few took this at face value, for it was well known amongst all tribes and cultures that if one could not truly identify the taste of a thing, then it was most often described as tasting of Grox. Now many believed that High Fleet Aura Burnis tasted like slowly smoked Eldar, and most agreed that High Fleet Tea Mat 
was more a palate cleanser, really. It was rather unassuming and watery, like eating cucumbers, maybe, whatever they were. Gorgon was like chewing rocks, and High Fleet Mendoza, like chomping on trees or other foliage, very stringy, bitter, and boring. High Fleet Hydra was fishy, like the little ones from the Toe Empire. There were more out there, everyone was quite sure. Like an amazing service that came to your very own home and provided not only entertainment, but then a fine repast. The Buggins were often seen as a gift from Gork and Mork themselves. No matter what happened, it would be a fantastic time, win, lose or draw. For the Buggins may well hide, but when discovered, they did not run. And there was no finer spectacle in melee combat than two races being motivated to not just defeat, but then to eat their opposition. Sidebar over. Cronan was no slouch in this situation either, as he made sure all of the main galleys on each stair sheep were ready for deliveries of the delicacies. If the floor space was correct, and the buggins in as many numbers as Cronan hoped, there would be far less, if any, need to forage on the way through the stars. Fine dining in a massive sheep. Although this pastor may have attempted to betray him and was secretly working for that rich Toba, he had indeed fulfilled his side of the bargain. Now, Cronan considered almost feeling a bit guilty about pummeling and smashing the being into dust. But then, one can never regret one's actions as long as they are made to the best of your ability, with consideration to all of the information one had at the time of making said decision. If there was one thing that could turn a chipper chappy into a down in the doldrums unhappy camper, it was most definitely regret weighing a body down. Luckily, Cronan, as with near all greenskins, had not even a whiff of a conscience in such situations, and thus his Elan, you know, his morale, was as fine as can be. Well, apart from being personally responsible for not being first into the ruck. But again, Cronan knew he had bigger fish to fry this day. Cronan was not even mildly surprised at the aquatic motifs that seemed to be playing out in his head as he looked over at the oddy Admiral Hackbar. But he grinned. For Cronan had decided exactly what he would do with this part of the duo of his fleet commanders. Grand Mouth Tartan, he had now decided, would lead his main fleets. He was not too cautious, was incredibly violent, and had a mean streak about ten miles wide. Yet, he was intimidated by Cronan, and even tragic violence made him nervous. Hence, Cronan had plumped on him being his direct fleet stooge. And that meant that the shrieking weirdo Hackbar could be used in the first leg of Cronan's plans. For Cronan did not intend to perform his attacks in a standard way. He intended to be so unfathomably cunning that not even Dahumis would be able to see what he was doing. And in that regard, the unfortunate preponderances of the disfigured Hackbar matched up to the use which Cronan had for him. And so it was that while the main engagement of the days were about clearing out the huge Space Hulk, the newly dubbed Orcs of Omen, Cronan and his second choice of Admiral were off in the outer regions of the system, loitering around the asteroid belts. For Cronan had been discussing his hopes with the mech boy, Izap, and his understudies, and Izap had divulged to his lord the ways of travelling across the stairs, and how they would have to go through the warp. He explained that things moved faster there, like everything was painted red by simply moving into that realm, but the travel would still take time. Thus, Cronan was mildly concerned that the boys would lose their fightiness if this kept up, so he made certain in every meeting with his new bosses that they were absolutely abundantly clear that there was to be no, and he meant zip, zero, use of Humi smeller fields across the fleet. When he also informed the admirals to remove the faces of Gork and Mork from the prows of their vessels, which were specifically designed to ward off cosmic horrors while in transit, the admirals both looked at him like he had been bashed over the head with a stupid stick, and then fallen backwards into a bottomless chasm of ignorance and smooth-brained incompetence, before finally landing on a spike of ancient providence, powered by runes cast by the guards themselves, stating, Here lies the stupidest orc of all time. But Cronan soon impressed upon both Admirals Hackbar and Grandmouth Tartan 
that he wished absolutely nothing to impede the armies of the Fat One, the Girl, the Nerd, and the Juice God from coming aboard if they thought they were odd enough. And that was final. And also, it was at that meeting that Cronin heard about rocks. How a large asteroid could be snagged and then pretty much scooped out and converted into a sheep of the orcs. And Cronin liked this idea indeed. Especially when Isaac informed him of how the rocks made planet fall and what effect it would have on any defenders of the world in question. After about an hour of laughter, which most indeed find slightly too long, to the extent that some of Cronan's legion looked at each other askance, Cronan demanded the creation of at least a baker's dozen of those most hilarious of rides. And so it was. The while of the fleet mainly concentrated on the Orcs of Omen, Cronan was off on the Mork rampant, shadowed by Hackbar's gutless wonder as they dragged one after another asteroid of any real size back to the gathered war. For Cronan was planning ahead now, and he had, in his infinite wisdom and cunning, discovered the art of multitasking. Now, I shan't go into a sidebar about that one just yet, seeing as we had the Bistro Buggins one and the Booty one, but I shall go into it in the future. Don't let me forget now. We all know how I rampage along on these massive waffles and get so carried away I miss out on many a new ones. And so it was. The Cronan was never idle any more. His break amongst the snake bites, still not that distant a memory, he was utterly energized and prepared to go the distance. And of course, that would mean he did not wish to take a break until he had reached his goal, his dream, his gaining of that elusive final prize in his growing collection. But I think we all know what he was thinking about then, eh? The gold ones. And so it was that the three massive mobs of orcs were conveyed to the awaiting hulk and quickly yomped into position on many, many levels all around the central segment of the sheep. This would be no cagey, creeping around with knees bent style of affair. Nobody would be rolling around in mud so the bastards could not see them, and none would be forming delicately overlapping two by two covering formation advances. No. This was to be done the orky way. Well, that is what most predicted anyway. When the final klaxon went off across the entire Space Hulk, set off early so the Buggins were fully awake and ready for the ructions, it was indeed a spectacle to fill even the heart of Mork with pride. For in that same moment, scores of hatches, airlocks, barricades and blast doors were finally ripped or burnt, pummeled or even blasted down by weird boys. And in came the orcs, as if it were a treasure hunt for a life-altering amount of bling. It was, of course, but the main effect was my intention. Imagine many thousands of soccer hooligans being given massive wraps of amphetamines and told that there is a secret stash somewhere inside the stadium just before the doors opened. Now imagine that green horde, all attempted to expose through the doors. The screaming, shouting and bellowing was eardrum bursting and that was not counting those being crushed in the stampede after they had lost their footing, or been tripped up by one of the many, many grots that had been marshalled at the entrance. For the grots were out in strength as well. Hidden amongst their number were not an inconsiderable number of vid grots, doing their best to take footage of the events. Being grots, and being given the one job in their life that they could genuinely be proud of, as all suspected, or at least hoped, that their own images would make it onto the war broadcast. The little runts went at it with verve and a real zeal. Yet amongst such an avalanche of the wee grots, none of the proper boys paid them a second thought or nor attention. Despite how many times the two orcs had bashed, slapped or cudgeled them back from the doorways, the instant said doorways were open. There was a shrill scream from every one of the wretches as they charged into the open spaces and corridors held by the buggins. Cronan watched from his battleship, the Mork Rampant, laughing as deeply as anyone else present as the carnage began, and it was an absolute bloodbath from the first second. As the orcs charged into the rooms and corridors, the leadership scripts of the three bosses swiftly became apparent. Tragic Violence, formerly a storm boy, 
and being accustomed to leading Cronin's black legion, was soon bellowing disparaging curses at his mobs as they did not adhere to, or simply could not remember, his overwrought formations. Yet, as he barged his way to the front, he kept his head and adapted quickly. After smashing a pyramid of grot dead, falling down from the higher ceiling of the entry room, he got stuck in nicely and pretty much went with the flow. He now merely thrust his power chopper in directions and shouted at those closest to him to fire into the darkness above. Soon, not only grots were amongst the falling dead. A flash boom grade was thrown up and the last of the buggins were slain by orcs shooting their entire clips in their general direction. And of course, being orcs, it was a very general direction indeed. But tragic violence was getting a handle on things now, and they pushed on. Good. He could be flexible when needed, thought Cronan. Cronan looked on in amusement as his favourite McMurder stood back from his main mobs for a moment as the doors went down, and he made a great gesture of bowing as the tsunami of grots passed him into the corridors. Docks themselves joined in and slapped each other on the back and chortled as they looked inside with McMurder. He was in fits of laughter so badly tears of mirth streaked his grimy face as he watched the barbarity that ensued, for the Buggins had a response wave of their own. As the grots who charged in were soon witness to an earthquake-like rumble as the stampeding Buggins came into view. Small at the most, they had claws instead of front hands and leapt into the fray. As they all screamed, hissed and screeched on both sides, the limbs, heads, blood and bones were spraying across the wall so much a river of liquids and offal began to run in the corridors. Cronin checked his data slate. Ah, these were Homer gits. But mirth could never overwhelm wild aggression for long, and Git Squisher McMurder now threw his bed back and bellowed. All his mobs followed suit, then they marched into the madness. McMurder was pushing forward now, and no buggin could match him. None could stand before his mighty and meaty power claw swings. As expected, Cronin thought, the mad lad was doing well. But what was this with Grinner the Backstabber? For it was utterly unexpected. Cronin's eyes were saucers as he watched the strangest thing in his life. After all the sighing, standing about rather crestfallen and verging on moping, Grinner had seemed to change tack on the flight between the Mork Rampant and the Orc of Omens, for he was right there, riding a wave of grots right into the middle of the first chambers, right at the front, and he was letting off such a colossal fusillade of darker that even Cronan was impressed. And Cronan finally saw why Grinner was a big boss. He was a whirlwind of twisting and firing, reloading and returning to it, annihilating all of the ceiling dwellers before even a single grot fell in his sector. Cronan darted to his data slate. Ah, these buggins were called lickers. Yet, when some of the lickers dropped down and tore through the grots around Grinner, he did not miss a beat. The majority of his orc mobs had been held back by the rushing grot, so Grinner was practically alone in the dead centre of the room. He dropped his shooters and drew out his double-handed, double-headed power chopper. And by gawk did he go to work. Cronan was finding a totally newfound respect of this hitherto underrated orc. For Grinner did not move from the spot. Well, he dodged upwards, twisted sideways, evaded literally scores of attacks from the nimble and lightning-fast lickers. Yet, so few connected with him before he made them into shish kebab. And so it was that Grinner seemed to relax somewhat when his mobs of real orcs passed him and charged into the main thoroughfares coming from the central room. But he did not scrimp on hollering out orders to his boys as they passed him. A slick mob of flash kits now hove to him in a circle. And from there, Grinner moved forward fast. Yet he was perpetually looking at something being projected from his hat. Cronan took note immediately, sitting up in a flash. Grinner's hat seemed to have some form of green light coming from it, projecting some form of schematic into his hand when he put it near his eye line. Odd, that. And Grinner then gathered more of his flash kits and the beefiest of knobs and started pushing in a completely different direction to the majority of his army. 
tragic violence now moved forward at a steady pace, following what was the river of awful and excretions. Yet soon enough, the grot stopped moving forward and started backing up and causing blockages, as they met resistance a little more fighty than mere Homer gets. This prong of the assault had gone into a region where the floors and walls were intensely shiny and slippy. Light appeared from nowhere and the walls themselves glowed. But this did not help the greenskins much, as the creatures within the light were as camouflaged as the previous liquors had been in the darkness. For out of seemingly endless side tunnels came four armed nasties. Their claws sliced through even mega armor like they were fishnet stockings. The speed was near that of an elder, their aggression equaling the orc's own, and they pelted into the orc horde and dragged victims down corridors, leading those who gave chase into rooms full of their kind. The orcs were not having an easy time of it at all, but that just made the entire event even more thoroughly enjoyable. As we have discussed before, this was a very finest quality fighting outside of charging into a legion of densely packed arse starters, something that had not happened in a veritable age. Not that Cronin would have known, of course. Speaking of which, he then thumbed his way through until he identified the buggins of White and Claw. They were the Spleen Stealers, or something like that. And crikey, they didn't half match up to the name this time. But back to the action. Tragic violence called for a close formation. He was right, of course, as the orcs could have then gunned down the spleen stealers when they burst from their side alleys, but again, it was not to be. So, now again going with the flow, Tragic Violence sent out knobs with heavy mobs to back up those who had followed the enemy down into those traps. By sheer weight of numbers, the dint of Cronan's effect on the girth and stature of the boys, they were now hammering the stealers wherever they found them, but the cost was incredibly high. In most regions, there was not one inch of light-panelled walls that were not spattered with buggin or orc blood. Progress was costly, but it was going apace. Back to Gitsquisher. Now Cronan had a front row seat for the next stages, as one gloriously dedicated grot had decided to just concentrate on the big boss of his wing of the army. Cronan himself leaned into the vid viewer as he saw what was happening next. For Gitsquisher McMurder and his gang had come into a huge cargo area of what was clearly a Humey ship interior, one they were used to at the least. For there were skulls and columns and images of the gaudy emperor of, of mankind all over the place. Of course, the image of the emperor always bothered Cronan. His eyes narrowed as he looked at the statues, wondering if that prophetic pervert was still watching him dump. But it was but a fleeting distraction as the action resumed. In a huge cargo bay, things now smashed into the air and fell around a huge force that was approaching the line of grots and orcs. The debris was hurled in all directions. The ground shook under the orcs as they leered at each other. Where anyone from any other race would probably have coloured the front or back of their britches, the orcs just giggled in anticipation. The clangor rose as the things got closer, then they barreled into view. Conan had them immediately, for he liked the look of these ones, twice the size of an orc at the shoulder, ten times the weight of one. They had massive scything talons and snapping claws, chitinous armor so thick that even Big Ducker ricocheted off their hides. When these things hit his lines, the green skins were smashed back, trodden under massive hooves, melted by gouts of plasma that seemed to burst from these things' moors. They were corny flexors, some of the most bitey and fighty on the menu. They were huge, but not that plentiful. Gitsquisher boomed out with laughter as he charged in amongst them. McMurder himself was a fine specimen of an orc, even for a boss, and he went to work. Bouncing and charging between the bidious buggins, he would put a crack grenade into his power claw, then punch it into the flanks or underbelly of a corny flex. He would then let go before pulling his claw out of the rampaging beast. Astonishingly, this brutal and cunning maneuver still did not finish off all he used it upon, and these buggins would have explosions of blood and viscera smash out from them, but if they survived the initial explosion, they regenerated so swiftly that they were soon back on the attack, and many who were killed then went into some mad death throes. 
their dying bodies lashing out at anything and everyone in range before expiring. Cronan was mightily impressed with how McMurder had performed yet again. For the cornyflexers who reacted to the boss were forced to follow him and turn their backs on the encircling shooter and chopper boys. And within no time at all, the last of the cornyflexers had been put down. On went Git Squisher McMurder and his mobs into even deeper realms of the sheep. Switching to the Vidgrot, who had been in the third force, Cronan could not really get a good angle on what was going on, for it seemed odd that so many of Grinner the Backstabber's flash kits seemed to accidentally unload their weapons into the Vidgrot. I mean, really unlucky shots, considering that there were so many grots about to check if their weapons were still active, yet one or two still remained. It seemed to Cronan that the previous momentum and valour of the boss had now depleted at a shocking rate. For now, he and his entourage seemed to be taking a very odd route indeed. They would move up stairwells, down corridors, then round corners. And, with tragic bad luck again, it seemed to War the Grinner was somehow not managing to encounter a single massing of the Buggins. Oh, he and his men were fighting hard, but it seemed to be against Termagits. Little things with guns that generally bounced off the flash kits in Grinner's armour. And on it went until the group met the central point and genesis of the wee buggin blighters. For Grinner and a score of his most heavily armoured lads dropped down into a room and unloaded shooter and blaster and heavy rockets into these large mama buggins, who were previously blurting out termagits like there was a competition to see who could birth the most. Tracy Garns confirmed Cronan on his data slate. Good. Strange that Grinner then seemed to move in more directions was simply dreadful luck, as there was a dearth of buggins of note to fight again. Now Cronan was almost feeling a little sad for Grinner, right in the middle of the action, yet getting only piffling amounts of it himself. But it was the hat again that drew Cronan's attention, for Grinner went back to checking the schematic from his hat. Cronan would have to take a peek at this hat, if Grinner made it back, of course. Yet Cronan's reverie was broken by a very unexpected occurrence. Tragic violence was leading from the front now, rooting for his boys to keep up with him. He led a charge down a very large corridor, so long that none could see its other side in the darkness. It was even longer than the corridor of Butts on Orquilonia. Yet something huge came flashing down it. The blast was so wide and powerful that it illuminated entire segments of its surroundings as it came closer. With simply no way to retreat, no place to duck, dodge or hide, tragic violence took it straight in the face. To Cronan's utter shock, Tragic had attempted to grab Grotz and boys and hold them in front of himself to mitigate some of the impact. Now Cronan was not shocked that he would instinctively choose to use others as a living orky shield, for had not Cronan himself done this very self-same thing in the Squig games, it was a tragic violence was unable to perform the deed well, despite it being shown practically nightly on the fleet vids. And it was with a sniff of disappointment and good riddance that Cronan watched as the ball of Buggins' energy smashed into tragic and lit him up like a poodle being hit by lightning. His skeleton showed up even behind his armor for the merest second, then... He was gone. His mighty boots the only thing left. The light now shone for a moment, down to the corridor's end, and there, standing at the aperture, but in a much larger room, was a huge Buggins with a meaty, darker blurter in hand. It was a trying to flex, a blast of Buggins par excellence. Nobody was getting down that corridor any time soon. Not because of the Buggins' fire, but because none dared to even begin the charge into that small confined tube of set and death. Cronan sighed. He had expected casualties, but not this stupid a death, and from the cat pain generous of his own honor guard. Yet Cronan now shrugged, smirked, and stood up. All on the bridge now looked at him and also leered as a word went out. The Black Legion was to go to war for Tragic had been slain, hence his entire army could be smashed without a decent boss being there to direct and hold the mobs together. With his vidgrots marching in front of Cronan so he could still enjoy the proceedings, 
he now made his way to the hangar bays of the Mork Rampant. The marching of his mega-armoured, mega-knob legion stomping behind him. Well, a few hundred anyways. Some more were already in situ, ready to counter any breakout attempts from the Buggins. But the Buggins were doing well, and they had no reason to leave their lairs. And so it was, the Cronan set off to take command of the third assault prong, and march his legion into the midst of the Terra Kid factory. To be continued.